Thank you, Sarah, that was beautifully put. Our speaker today, Reverend Rona, enjoys interpreting the Bible metaphorically and metaphysically. She believes that our life's work is to connect with the energy we call God and live as expressions of God. Today, Reverend Rona invites us to ask ourselves, what if I didn't mind? Lawrence Kirby is a gifted musician with that wonderful walnut or mahogany voice. He's also a barbecue king. Not only can he cook up a wicked good feast, he can also fix a barbecue in distress. Let's listen and relax as Lawrence sings us into meditation and Reverend Rona's message. Take it away, Lawrence. you are when the sun comes over the mountains and whose side you are when the dew is all dried up and gone and whose side you are while the afternoon winds are blowing And whose side you on When the eleven o'clock news is done showing Children of tomorrow, don't you worry First time's not in a hurry And after all's been said and done We'll all burn as brightly as the sun Whose side you on? Now the fighting has long been over and whose side you on When there's no one looking over your shoulders And whose side you on When the afternoon winds come When you lay your mind is drifting Children of tomorrow, don't you worry First time's not in a hurry And after all's been said and done When all you've left 
is here and now. And whose side you are when joy could be the order of the day. And whose side you now the fears of the world have melted away Children of today there are no problems God in her wisdom has not solved them And after all's been said and done Brightly as the sun I invite you to close your eyes if that is comfortable for you and become aware of your breath, that flow of life coming into your body and releasing from your body as we enter into a 12 power meditation. I bring your attention to the space in your brain. Imagine between your ears in the center of your head. The seat of faith. Faith represents that which we trust but we may not see. It is deeply held, hidden between both hemispheres of our brain. Next, move down your body to the base of your spine. Bring your attention to your tailbone, to the base of your spine where strength resides. Where we find our support. We pair faith and strength together so that strength helps to support our faith. Strength enables us to hold the course when our faith starts to waver. Faith and strength work together. Next, move down in your mind's eye to your abdomen, to the seat of release and new life which pair together. Just as life cannot exist 
on just the in-breath. So new life cannot begin without the release of the old. We pair these two powers together, our ability to let go, which makes room for new life. Then we move to the base of our belly. The place of order. Where everything happens in a perfect and right order. Our ability to organize, our ability to make sense, our ability to apply structure. And then move way up on your body to the back back of your neck, to the base of your neck. This is the seat of zeal, of excitement, of passion. We pair the two together because without order, our zeal may not have a focus. And so when our passion is combined with our ability to organize, we can create amazing, beautiful things. And next we move to our belly button, to our stomach. The seat of wisdom, where we sometimes say we have a gut feeling. It is the seat of discernment, judgment, And we combine it with our heart, with love, our power to love. The reason these two are combined is because love without wisdom may take us to places that are not for our good. And so we combine the power of discernment with the power of love in order to express the best of life for ourselves. Next, we move to the base of our throat, the seat of our power, the power of our words, word, words, speech. We combine this power with the space between our eyes, which is the seat of imagination. We combine these two powers together because 
when we are feeling powerless, when it feels that we are literally not able to speak. Our imagination can support us as we discover new possibilities and imagine new ways of approaching whatever situation we may be in. So we pair the power of our throat, our power of power, our ability to speak with imagination between our eyes. And then we move to our forehead. the seat of our understanding, our ability to understand. And we pair that with the top of our head where we hold willingness. Because we all know it is not enough to merely understand something unless we are willing to put our understanding to practice. When we combine these 12 abilities and we have them in right relationship with each other, we create a life of fullness, abundance, peace, joy, faith, and strength, release and new life, order and zeal. wisdom and love, power and imagination, understanding and will. Twelve abilities we all have. Let us use them wisely. A story from Eric Butterworth's great book, Discover the Power Within You. I quote, Sidney Harris, the distinguished news columnist, tells of visiting a friend who is a Quaker for the weekend. Each evening, he would walk to the corner with his friend to buy the evening newspaper. His friend would be cheerful and pleasant, but the newsy would always reply with a grunt. Harris commented one night, he's a mighty unpleasant fellow, isn't he? And the Quaker friend replied, oh, he's always that way. Harris, confused, said, but why are you so nice to him? And the answer is a classic that reflects a deep understanding of Jesus' law of non-resistance. The Quaker said, but why should I let him determine how I am going to act? How why should I let him determine how I am going to act? I read the story 
years ago, and it has always stuck with me. Because I don't know if I would have taken such a high road. I don't know if I would have been so separate enough, so differentiated enough, so independent that with repeated instances of someone grunting at me, essentially dismissing me, I'm not sure if I would always continue to be friendly and always continue to be who I would like to be. And so I offer the question to you. How would you act in the story? How do you behave when the people around you don't behave the way that you would like them to? The first point I want to make is that our normal reaction is to get upset when people don't do what we expect. Please tell me I'm not the only one out there who gets upset when people don't do things we, the, the way we expect them to. It is a normal reaction to you know, meet like with like, to take an eye for an eye, to respond to anger with anger, to upset with upset, to frustration with frustration. Or when people do get upset and then we get upset, we move into one of four things. We fight, we get to a place where we become irritated or frustrated or angry, and we make sure that the other person knows those things, which often will lead into some kind of an argument, some kind of a, um, an education which then actually becomes a, a form of aggression. So fight. Or we decide that we don't want to be part of it, and so we flee, we leave. We choose not to go, we avoid. Or we decide that we freeze, like we're so blindsided by this that, that we don't do anything. We neither respond with anger, nor do we respond as we would in our normal everyday world. Or we fix. We try to make it so that the other person is, is either less anxious, which means we take on their anxiety, we do too much in the hope that they will become, le uh, become less angry and more calm, or we do too little in the hopes that the person will feel better and we sort of adjust and move around them. So when someone is upset with us, our tendency is to become upset. Or when we get upset at something, our tendency is to fight, freeze, flee, or fix. And that can cause others to become upset with us. Sometimes we're the newsy and sometimes we're the Quaker. The goal is to be the Quaker all the time. The question then is what can we do to behave in the way that this Quaker behaved? What if, like him, we didn't mind? Let's take a look at that story again. In the face of misery and grumpiness, at that moment, that 
Quaker visitor, a Quaker man had a choice about how to respond. He could have done all those things that I just spoke about. Instead, he chose none of them. He chose the most powerful response, which was to stay in his own lane, to stay in his own integrity, to stay in his own values, and allow the other person to have the experience of his own emotions, whatever is going on for him. He allowed the other person to be who the other person was, and he allowed himself to be who he was. Imagine if he chose not to do that. If he had responded with anger or frustration or avoidance or, or fixing or some of those, what would the end result have been? The end result would have been that two people would now have been upset instead of just one who was happy in his grumpiness. What if we didn't mind? Think for a moment when you've had a similar sort of experience in your life. Maybe someone has said something that upsets you. Maybe someone has made a judgment about you. Maybe they've said things like you're not smart enough. Or maybe they've said that you're too smart. Or maybe they've said that you talk too much. Or maybe they've said that you don't talk enough. There's so many judgments to pick from. Or someone does something that frustrates you. Maybe they leave the cupboard doors open all the time, or they don't pick up their clothes, or they have some other kind of habit that just drives you up the wall. In any event, whatever it is that they say or that they've done, if it's put you into a place of anxiety or worry, then what can you do? What is the impact of that? Well, of course, when you're in a place of worry and anxiety, you are suffering. And so when we're upset, we suffer, we imprison ourselves, we put ourselves into a place of upset. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, Matthew 5, chapter, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 25, he says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Well, I think what Jesus was talking about here is actually the accuser in I think it could be both ways, frankly. It could be the accuser out there, like somebody judging you, and also the accuser within you who is making a judgment about their judgment. The truth is that with all of that, as soon as we move into a place of anxiety, we are putting ourselves into a prison. We are making it so that we are the ones who are now carrying the load of whatever that judgment is. And so I think the idea of coming to terms quickly with our accuser is the way to freedom. It's the way to calm. What if we didn't mind? Well, how do we do that? We live in relationship with others. So how do we 
come to terms with with people who are different than we are. Well, I encourage you to think in terms of um, a Venn diagram or think of those, you know, those silver magician's rings that kind of go together and then they can come apart and um, they look like they're completely bound together and then all of a sudden they magically break free. Well, our goal is not for them to break free and be separate from each other, but let's pretend that one ring is you and the other ring is this grumpy newsy, whatever it might, newspaper man. Well, our goal isn't to break apart. Our goal is to be separate and still be connected, to still maintain a connection. Our goal is to let the emotional reaction of the other be theirs, and we don't have to take it on. We don't have to react. We don't have to get angry. We don't have to run away. We just need to let them have their reaction and stay in our own ring and be true to who we are. And recognize that, <laughs> as one of my instructors used to say, other people are not failed attempts at being you. Other people are not failed attempts at being you. Each person has their favorite things, their little idiosyncrasies, just as we do. Walt likes all of the doors, for example. Walt likes all of the doors in the house to be closed. He thinks it gives the house a more finished look if the doors are closed. I like them to be open because for me, it just kind of feels more expansive if the doors are open. Question is, who is right? Answer is yes. There is no right or wrong, it's just preferences. So what if you didn't mind that? What if you didn't mind the fact that people are different and will behave differently than we expect? It would be a way that we can then not take things on. My friend Martha Creek has a couple of really wise sayings about this. The first is become a funnel, not a sponge. We don't need to take on their emotion, their preference. We don't even have to agree with it. We don't have to like it. But we can change how we respond to something. The other thing she says is where two or more are gathered, there will be bristling. What if we can accept that? What if we can recognize that there are differences? Not just recognize that there are differences, but expect differences. And then recognize that the only person who I can change, the only person I have power over, is me. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we're told to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. What if we adjusted our expectation so that we didn't mind? that we could expand our tolerance for discomfort, especially discomfort of another person's behavior or discomfort of something that another person does that just drives us bananas. It means that we're the one who's getting driven bananas. It's like, who's pushing you, my buttons? If they're my buttons, I'm pushing them. 
I get to change whether or not those buttons actually need to be there or not. Now I can hear you almost through this computer right now saying, yeah, but what about accountability? What about if they are doing things that are absolutely unacceptable? Yes, that's definitely something that we want to pay attention to. But when we're in a place of anxiety, when we're in a place of frustration, when we're in a place where we're meeting frustration with frustration, anger with anger, you know, tolerant, intolerance with intolerance, when we are so judgmental about their, whatever it is that we ourselves have become intolerant of that which we have viewed as intolerant, when we are in that place, we are not really functioning at a place from a place of thoughtfulness or a place of um, responsibility. We are functioning at that point from a reaction. And there is no thought that is meaningful in that place. So even when there is an accountability that needs to happen, a discussion, a request, a crucial conversation of some kind, taking the break, putting the brakes on and breathing, calming ourselves down to the point of, what if I don't mind? Now I can be in a place where I can have a discussion about a boundary or a limit or something like that. When we're in fight, flee, freeze or fix mode, we aren't in the place where we can have that discussion in a meaningful and compassionate way. So, Imagine, imagine being in a place where you are as that Quaker friend, where at any choice point you can come to terms with the differences between you and somebody else. What if you didn't mind how they behaved? What if the way they behaved had absolutely no impact on who you are and how you show up, how you respond? Then you're in a place of integrity in a place where you are personally still powerful, then you, like the man in our story, can respond with calm, with equanimity, with peace, with a place from a place of self-knowing. Why should I let him or her, or them. Why should I let them determine how I am going to act? Next time you're in a place where you're tempted to get frustrated, or you're tempted to flee, or you're where you are tempted to get upset. I invite you to ask the question, what if I didn't mind? How would I be? Who would I be? And how will I respond? What if you didn't mind? I bless you.
All right. This is a song written by George David Weiss and Bob Thiel for Louis Armstrong to sing in 1967. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, the bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky are also on the faces of people going by i see friends shaking hands saying how do you do they're really saying i love I hear babies cry I watch them grow They'll learn much more Than I'll ever know And I think to myself What a wonderful world Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Well, thank you, Lawrence, for your delightful and comforting singing. And Reverend Rona, thank you so much for your enlightening and reassuring message. We really need to hear that these days. <laughs>